I was in the middle of a little home project and to modify some garden lights and it started evolving and it got to the point of ridiculousness and I thought, okay, at this point in time I should really start the camera and record this because it might be sort of inspiring to some of you to actually try something similar. So these are pound shop lights. Pound shop is our dollar store in the UK and this particular version, it's a new type. It, normally these have a sort of white translucent cover. But in this instance, they've gone for this clear cover, clear cover, clear cover, but they've kept the same module inside. And unfortunately, that is just a generic, it's got a cold white LED. And what you get when you put this over the dome is that you see a slight reflection off the inside, but it's not exactly inspiring. However, it made me realise that you could uh, potentially make a little cluster. You could make a little, shall we say, a little tree of LEDs inside one of these. And the one I've decided to go with is a green, because this is a nice apple green. So I'll put the other one out of the way, and we shall start the project. So to build up a little tree of LEDs, I've got these uh, flat front LEDs. I was looking for straw hat. I didn't have any straw hat. What would have been nicer would have been the concave lens LEDs. And I have found a source of those. I've ordered some. They're so rare on eBay, but I found a seller and I'm going to provide a link to it down below because if everybody buys some from that seller, maybe they'll get the message that these are quite a, a desirable item. So these, however, are a flat top LED that lights up green. I shall plug it in and you can see it lighting up green. He said, not getting a very good connection there. These, uh, these little sockets are not great, but there we go. It's green. However, when you're going to be using a lot in parallel, as I'm about to do, you kind of have to match them because if you put several LEDs in parallel, and particularly at low current, like these circuits, the solar circuits work at, then you'll find that if one's got a slightly lower forward voltage, it really, it lights up brightly and the others are dragged down because it pulls the voltage down a bit below the point at which they'd pass a similar current. So I thought, well, what I usually do is I put this in the sort of two milliamp setting here, this is really, the, the connector is really sort of wearing out in this. That shows how much I use it. And I normally just sort of uh, bridge LEDs across that one and to keep stacking them in parallel like this and, and then uh, flash them up. And when you do that, you can see the ones that are hogging the current or, you know, for instance, this one on the left actually looks brighter than the others. So that is probably a sort of lower voltage one. But I thought a better way to do that might be to make a little adapter based on these standard connectors. You can get big bunches of these off eBay. And there are 2.5 millimeter pitch. Is this a, is this a GST or an XH? Can't really remember. There are so many different brands of connectors and they all seem to have random names. So I've got a USB plug and I've chosen a couple of resistors. The reason I use two resistors here was just to bring them the terminals both up to the same height. They're not exactly passing a lot of current. In fact, it's only going to be a couple of milliamps. And I crop these leads down and join them together, twist them together. So I'm going to solder them onto this and then I'm going to sleeve it and uh, add a little bit of hot milk glue probably just to hold everything together. And that should hopefully uh, give me a sort of simple thing that I can plug into a USB power bank and then just plug loads of LEDs in and then match them for intensity. So I'm going to crop these leads down. This is where when I help melt the solder, they're all going to ping apart. That does happen from time to time. And I'm going to flow some solder onto the pins of these resistors and then reflow them together. So I'm going to put a deliberate blob on those. I'm going to put a little bit more solder on this one, hoping it doesn't all ping apart. It may ping apart. If it does, you know, that's just one of those things. Oh, it's doing its best to ping apart. That's kind of predictable. And then I'm just going to make sure I've got the right polarity here. Uh, the positive is on this side. I'm going to add a bit of flux just to make sure everything does go together. I'll use a wee brush flux. I got another tub of flux. This particular stuff I'm using is Topnik RF800, which is a, it's a alcohol diluted flux, which you have to be careful about because uh, it does, you know, when you put flux on, it does evaporate and just leave a film. So I'm going to float this on here. I'll do it on the outside. And solder directly above my fingers. That looks dangerous. But to be fair, I'm kind of used to soldering, so it's not such a hazard for me, but it's not something I'd recommend if you're new to soldering. Soldering above your fingers could carry a very harsh lesson. So I've soldered that on, 
just, I'm going to check this. I'm going to put one LED in. And then I'm going to stuff it into a power bank and see what happens. So here is a Chafer Peng power supply from China. Uh, that's looking fine, so that one is lit. Excellent. So I've got a bit of heat shrink here. And I'm going to size it to cover up to about... Where's the scissors? Where are my scissors? Oh, my toolbox is gradually... And by toolbox, I mean a cardboard box in the vicinity. It's gradually just filling up with stuff again. That wasn't even square. I'll cut that just a little bit more square. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to actually space these apart and put a blob of hot melt glue in by using the hot air pen that I'll be using for the heat shrink as well. So this is currently set for about, let's nudge that up, let's nudge it up to about, oh, 200 degrees Celsius. And I shall melt the hot melt glue stick by pointing this at it. And then once it's melted enough, I'll just use it like a, well, like a hot melt glue stick, basically, and I'll just actually smear some to bridge these things. Not sure how well this is going to work. Maybe it's going to be terrible. No, it's not, actually. It looks like it's it's all right. I may actually just... I may actually just squish that whole bit of hot melt glue stick in. The project has already gone very slightly wrong, but then this is not a surprise for me, is it? Yeah, this is, this is all getting messy, and uh, yeah, I should maybe have rehearsed this bit beforehand, but I didn't. Righty, well, that's, a, that's a glue everywhere now. Excellent. Uh, let's put the hot, melt, hot air gun out of the way, because that was, not, that was not what was supposed to happen. And I shall just uh, smear a bit more of glue on. Smearing is the order of the game here. Uh, and I'll smear some there. This is messy, but that's okay. I have no regrets. Now comes a tricky bit where I have to now get the hot, the heat shrink stuff past that. And if I linger too long, it's going to start shrinking onto it. That looks all right. Oh no, glue everywhere. On my fingers. Ah, no. Righty ho. Let's get the hot air gun in again. And we'll put the heat shrink down. Hopefully the glue will then fill in the middle of that and just make it kind of strong. It's a good way of reinforcing connections like this. And avoiding short circuits inside. Ah, the glue is flowing nicely inside there. And so I make it more rigid as a result. That looks pretty good. I shall squish it down towards the connector so that if it mates onto the connector, it'll make the whole lot solid and it'll protect the solder connections and the pins. Now that is done, we can use this to actually compare the LEDs. So I'm going to stuff some LEDs in here. And on its own, this would be quite nice as an ornament. Because uh, it will run for ages from a standard little power bank. Because uh, if you use the simple power banks, like this, then they just put out 5 volts all the time. And that's good because uh, if you use the clever, intelligent, high-capacity power banks, they will monitor the load. And if it goes too low, they will just automatically cut off. And that's quite annoying, particularly if you want to run a low load. And some people end up putting packer resistors just to keep it awake. So you might actually only be using 5 milliamps, but then you have to use a packer resistor to draw 100 milliamps, which kind of defeats the point of portable power. Let's put these in. Let's also get this hot melt glue off my fingers. I'm also going to be doing foolish things like soldering wires onto batteries, uh, rechargeable batteries, which is a terrible idea. It's not to be recommended. Okay, what do we have here? These are looking... They're not too bad, actually. They are fairly well matched. There's so very little difference between them. So they, those are all in parallel and running at low current. This is the point that, you know, this could just be stood on its own. And the... LEDs splayed out and it would actually just be quite a nice little ornament on its own. But in this instance it has uh, shown these LEDs are all fairly well matched. This is good. In the bad old days, when you got batches of LEDs, the variation in the first gallium nitride LEDs was horrific. You know, they'd be really widely varying in voltage. So if you put lots in parallel, you'd end up with uh, some that were inevitably much dimmer or brighter than others. They've improved. So I've got 10 LEDs. I don't think I'm going to use all 10 LEDs. 
what my plan is with this is I'm going to pull out the module. And here's something interesting. It's the classic little thing that it's got a, the generic circuit board, that little four pin chip in it. What is the four pin chip in this one? It's called ENA6180. That's a different name than the normal type. That's, a, that's interesting. Uh, it's normally an XY or YX chip in there, but it's not this time. That's uh, interesting. I guess if it's popular, it's going to get copied. I tested this, this little solar panel. Uh, it's really remarkable. Now, note that the connections are on here. For some reason, if I shine a light from below, you'll see there's a couple of little lines either side of those connections. I wonder if they've also put a little dam around the edge. Some of them create a little... Uh, shall we say, a moat at the edge, the etch a line with a laser, which uh, presumably it stops the uh, water sort of getting past that because the layer of lacquer they put in the back will go through that line. <laughs> uh, this thing, when I hold it up to my 20-watt uh, light here, it uh, puts out 60 milliamps. That's ridiculous for such a small uh, solar panel. So in bright sunshine, this little button cell here is going to have a, a very rough time. It's going to be grilled. So uh, I'm thinking of changing that for a bigger battery, keeping the solar panel um, and the LED here. I'm going to whip that out and I'm going to put a little socket in its place with the socket put through this hole so that I can plug anything I like into it. So um, let's... Let's do that. Can I just force this in? Is it going to fit if I use unreasonable force? Yes, it is. Unreasonable force always wins. That means I'm not going to be able to put the little module back up there, I don't think. Nah, not really. I'll just lay it flat. I'll glue it in. Um, I'm going to change the cell. I'm going to change that LED. Let's just do that right now. So the best way to desolder these LEDs, uh, note the polarity first. Negative is towards the battery, which it's connected to, presumably the battery negative then. And uh, the positive is towards me. Melt both connections at once with the solder and then wiggle that LED out. And this is where a bit of uh, um, desoldering wick is quite handy. And once again, I'm going to put a bit of flux in this because it works so much better with a dash of flux on it. If you have desoldering wick and it doesn't seem very, very solder sucky, then just uh, add a little touch of flux onto it like this and that will uh, improve it greatly, significantly. So let's put that on there. What would have also helped is flowing new solder on because uh, if this is lead free solder, it, uh, it may actually be a bit harder to get off. We'll see what happens. Maybe it's not lead free solder. Ooh, uh, those are those pads nice and clear. While I'm on at that, maybe I should get the battery off as well. Yeah, let's get the battery off as well, because I'm going to, and this is where you don't want to bridge both terms of the battery. Although these little batteries are not very big, they can do some weird things when you shorten them out. I've been sent pictures of uh, solar lights where these have basically just popped and melted and then blown apart inside. I'm not really surprised though, given how badly they get treated in solar lights. So let's get uh, let's use the desoldering wick to clean those off. Because I will be soldering a newer, bigger battery on afterwards. Other things that I shall be doing are the little switch on it I'll be bridging out because they're the curse of solar lights, those little switches. They're terrible. You never use them once they're in use. They're only really designed to protect the battery from over-discharge during shipping and storage. But um, they are very prone. I'm just not sucking the solder off that at all, am I? No, I'm not. Right, tell you what, I'm going to add a touch of solder. Uh, actually, I'll add a touch of flux to it. Here's my pen. I'll add more flux on the desoldering braid. I probably didn't uh, add flux up to that height. That shows the difference it makes. And there's no harm in just adding a touch more on the back of this pad as well. That will help melt the solder. The flux just basically cleans surfaces and lets the solder flow better. It makes it more juicy. Hopefully you guys can see everything okay here. Maybe I should have zoomed in.
But the peril of zooming in is sometimes I just get distracted. I will zoom in just a little tiny bit, but not too much because, uh, well, that is too much, isn't it? But not to worry, it's what I've done. Right, let's uh, get this in. So here is the new LED holder. And I shall put in this connection here and solder it with moist lead-based solder. Here we go. So one of the things I was saying there, the little button cell they provide isn't very generous, and it might have been okay in the bad old days when those solar panels, they seem to have increased in efficiency, the amorphous cells. They seem to have really put out a lot more current these days. I don't recall them putting out quite as much as they do now. These little things used to only put out a few milliamps. Now they're putting out 60, and when you consider that this little button cell is rated probably, does it say what it's rated? 40 milliamp power, then it's being charged at more than it's rated, uh, it's 1C, which is its sort of rating. Um, and not just that, but this thing would be tr fully charged in less than an hour in bright sunlight, and then you've got another 12 hours of bright sunlight or 8 hours of bright sunlight. So it's being grossly overcharged every day. Maybe that's why these little cells fail. So what I'm going to put in, I'm going to put in a Kodak branded dollar store, a pound land, a cheap battery, two for a pound. It's only rated about 300 milliamp hour, but that's a huge upgrade from that. Let's do that bit next. So to solder onto this, and I really don't recommend soldering, particularly lithium cells, it's not a good idea because the cell could potentially break down inside and then burst into flames and do weird shit. So I'm going to scrub this with a fiberglass pen. These pens are great. They Basically, it's like a propelling pencil, but it's got a little fiberglass thing inside that, uh, that really provides a clean surface. Although the usual problems with fiberglass are that, you know, it's very itchy if those little spiky bits get into you. Let's uh, wipe it on my jumper. That's a great idea, but uh, going to make the jumper itchy as well. Superb. Let's use a generic solder uh, wire stripper, should I say, and let's solder onto that. But I'm not going to connect it onto the circuit board quite yet. I will solder onto the battery, though, just to get that out the way. This is part of the reason that they recommend welding the tabs onto the batteries, because when you heat it with a soldering iron, particularly with the lithium, it's got the thin plastic separators, and if they melt, uh, this battery could really just go up and smoke right now. Tell you what, let's get some flux on it. Let's get some flux, and that's going to help things just a little bit. To have a flux. Um, and then I'll do the other side as well. So let's get some solder onto that, because the flux will help that mate, and just not too long, not too long. There it is, that's enough. No more. There's a fine art to just dabbing that on for the right length of time. It's a bit like basically soldering onto a bomb, so it's not that great. Let's see if I can solder onto this pit. The pit looks as though it's probably less of a risk, but I'm probably not less of a risk. That took the solder quite well. Excellent. Let's put some uh, solder on these wires and then tack them onto the battery. Not recommended, but, you know, I occasionally do it because it's uh, sometimes easier than getting a battery holder. And the battery holders are also prone to corrosion. There's a slight risk. It may burst into flames while you're soldering it. Don't do it on fully charged cells. And as I say, I don't really recommend it on lithium cells at all. That's looking pretty good. The battery is ready. The ends are not stripped, so it's kind of safe. Let's get the LEDs. Let's make the little LED thing now. Oh, you know what? Tell you what. Let's bridge out the uh, the switch. So if you look at the switch, you'll find that it's got th usually about three connections. And two of them will be common and one will be open. That You basically just want to short everything out so that switch is not in circuit anymore. Because the switches are notorious for corroding. So just flowing some soldier across like that bypasses a switch and it works again. I wish now, I was fixing some lights recently for my brother Ralphie and uh, he had some Ikea lights, quite posh, big chunky ones with wooden tops and they'd packed in. I thought it was the batteries had failed. It turned out in both instances it was the switches that had failed. Now I'm going to bring in this. 
So the idea for my little tree inside, and at this point in time I could just plug LEDs into that, but I'm going to plug a little illuminated tree, and it's going to have LEDs all over it. I'm just going to check that this is all going to fit. Is this going to fit? I'll make it fit. It will fit. Let's get that pin into the correct place. And see if that wire is... That wire is right up against the top, but that's all right. I shall start with an LED at the top then. And then add some LEDs all down the side. So I've put a little red dot in here just to remind me that that's positive at that side. And I'm going to get the first of these LEDs and I'm going to tin the tip of that wire and add an LED right in the very end. That in its own right would be an interesting effect. It would just be a, a pinpoint of light at the top of this uh, solar light inside the, the plastic dome. I'm going to move the plastic dome out of the way. I've got a terrible habit of touching things like that with a soldering iron and knackering them. So uh, let's crop these leads down. If you're, It's worth checking. The long lead is the positive in the LEDs. It's usually connected to the short electrode up the side with the negative being the one with the reflector on it for the chip, but that's not always the case. But it's worth mentioning that. It's worth checking it just to make sure everything's going to uh, be in the right direction. It'd be so disappointing if you sold them all in the wrong direction. Let's tin those leads. The LED has just popped out my fingers like a cork. Oh no, it's done it again. Lack of planning, probably. Let's try holding it more delicately and not squeezing it. I just want to solder some... I put some solder on one of the leads. Tell what, I just will put some solder on one of the leads. And then I'll tack it into place and then I'll solder the other one, flow the solder on properly on that one. So this uh, one I've just tacked is the positive... So I'm going to solder, reflow that like this. That was a bit messy, but not to worry, I have no regrets. I'm going to bend the other lead down to match that. That's just pinged into place itself perfectly. It'll probably ping right back out of place. That's looking pretty good. I'll let that cool and the solder harden and then I'll just uh, basically I shall add a touch of flux and reflow this one just because that seems like a good idea. It looks a bit crusty and dry. This is what happens when the flux evaporates out. It's worth mentioning at this point in time that if you're new to soldering, the flux is really important. Carrying solder over to the joint, uh, the flux, if I put this on, you'll see the flux evaporate off. Once that flux is all evaporated off, it's gone. You've got dry solder at that point, and it will create crusty joints. This is looking okay. I do have a slight peak there. I shall clip that off. Excellent. Now, what I want to do, I'm not really sure the best way to do this. Uh, I want to, the long lead is the anode. I want to get the negatives. And I want to start, I want to solder a little patch along here. And this is where when you're making these open frames, these dead bug soldered sort of arrangements, uh, you have to be careful not to put the solder connections too close together because if you do, other solder connections will pop off. As will probably be demonstrated while I make this video. So let's uh, grab some more LEDs and build a little LED tree. So I'm going to tin the negatives. And I'm going to bridge that across. This is where it would be quite nice actually plugged in so it lit up. And I'm going to reflow that quickly so the heat doesn't travel along and start uh, desoldering that bit. And I'm going to get the next one and I'm going to tin it. Make sure I have it in shot. That would be really helpful being in shot. I do have to check occasionally. Next one goes on. It's quite time consuming this, but I have to say it doesn't feel it when you're doing it. It's actually quite enjoyable. Uh, if this drags too much, feel free. Well, you're doing it anyway, aren't you? You know to skip forward if you find a bit of a video is a bit slow. You can go right to the end and see the finished result if you want. That's uh, one of the joys of YouTube. Not just video on demand, but uh, you can skip and bounce about and find the bits you like. What you're going to end up here is a completely custom solar light that's going to look quite nice. It's going to have lots of points of light in it. 
Oh, that didn't quite go to plan, but that's all right. I can desolder that and start again. Messy, but that's okay. Uh, and another one. I wasn't planning on using so many LEDs, but I am now. You can really go to town when you're doing this. You can actually stack more LEDs off the other ones. There is no limit. You can v revisit it afterwards and add more LEDs. They just have to match because otherwise you'll end up that situation of the one stealing all the current. Rightio, that is me sorted the first layer of those little leaves. And, uh oh, did you see that? Did you see that? I hadn't quite sorted that one, had I? Uh oh. I have now. Maybe I'll have some patience and let it cool down, said Clive, making terrible excuses. I'm now going to flip this over. And I'm going to solder all the other connections on the other side. I'm going to leave that one point out because it looks quite nice. It looks kind of leaf-like. So I'm going to solder these on. I'm not going to push them into position too much because I don't want them stressed because I will be flowing more solder onto these solder joints. I almost bridged with a big blob of solder down to the one below. But I didn't. Excellent. Now... I'm going to flip it back over this way again and I'm going to turn it round the other way and I'm going to add more LEDs because you just can't have enough LEDs. Uh, I'm going to choose these ones and just leave one solitary LED in its own. No. Poor little lonely LED. So let's solder this onto here. Customising stuff is good. You know, it just it feels nicer that you, you've got something that nobody else has. And the only way they can have that is either to pay you to make it for them, or ask you to make it for them, but don't offer because everybody will just want all of them. And then you'll end up regretting as you sit there night after night making lights up for people. That uh, soda was still hot. Ow! Reflow. I think this will work. I think it will work. If it doesn't work, we'll make it work. Now, there's another thing we can do here. The little uh, circuit boards in the solar lights have an inductor on them, and the inductor is used to step up the voltage. Part of the reason they do that is because it means they can use a smaller, lower voltage solar panel, and it also means they only need to use one button cell and by not putting multiple button cells in series like traditional old solar lights used to have, it doesn't have that problem that the first one that goes flat gets charged and reversed by the other cell or cells. So that's one of the advantages. It cuts costs and also makes them more reliable. These little chips, the little four pin chips, actually have a voltage sensor usually in them that once the voltage drops below about one volt, it will actually cut off. So it protects the, the, the nickel metal hydride cell. They're clever little things. But so mass produced that you can go into places like Poundland and you can buy two solar lights for a pound containing the little modules. Uh, it's just a great thing to hack. I'll let that cool down. And then I'll flip it over and so do the other ones. And that should be more or less our little tree done. Let's see if I can knock all the LEDs off in the process. So, reflow. Not bridging down, that's good. Sometimes uh, you just get the urge to put as many LEDs in as you can in this style. But let's uh, keep it in moderation. Can I test this? Not really conveniently. I'm kind of regretting not uh, leaving, not connecting, leaving the little button cell in. Could have done that, could have tested it, but here it is. Here is the little LED tree. That looks quite nice, doesn't it? Uh, I shall put this out of the way. Uh, what can I do? I can test it with uh, this little thing, but it's super low current, but it will show me if it's working. They are glowing. It is micro low current. It's like, like micro apps it puts through, but they are all glowing, uh, which is good. Next, we're going to take this Cell now, is this going to fit underneath this okay? I shall unplug my little adapter. It's got one solitary LED in it. I shall put that LED, I'll just leave it there just in case I need it. 
Uh, so this module here, there's room enough underneath to stick that out the way. Is there room for the cell? It's going to be a bit tight for the cell. Can that go down the middle? Oh, that looks good. Yes, it can. It can go right down the middle of that. That means with a couple of wires, you could actually upgrade that to a double A down the inside of this, couldn't you? Oh, that's useful to know. That is very useful to know. Right, tell you what. Let's uh, crop these leads one at a time so it doesn't go kaboom. Uh, then we'll solder it into the, uh, where the, the battery goes. So I shall leave them relatively long-ish. And I shall crop them one at a time. Now see this little inductor here. This little inductor has the colour bands. Red, red, brown. Red, red, brown, very hard to see in that horrible green background, but that's a typical value. It's 220 micro henries. You can buy these little inductors online and it, they are used to step the voltage up by this little chip that does everything. And if you change it from a 220 micro henry inductor up to a 330 micro henry inductor, the higher the value of inductor, the lower the intensity of the LED, but the longer the battery lasts. So if you have solar lights you're in winter, then by having, you could have a set of winter lights that have the higher value inductors that would run for much longer at night, but a lower intensity. But in summer, when you've got tons of sunlight and a decent battery, you could change that. You could change it to 100 microhenry. I don't think I've got any 100 microhenry at the moment. I have to get some more. And that will make it brighter, but draw more current from the battery. But that's not a great deal because the battery is, uh, you know, going to be bigger and you've got sunlight to charge it. Let's put this in the right way around. That would probably be a good idea. Not make the little circuit go poof and let out the magic smoke and make that crack noise and this sort of slight hiss. As they do. Other things worthy of note here, you could theoretically use colour changing LEDs, but the problem with using the colour changing LEDs is that uh, you'd have to add a diode and capacitor to this to uh, smooth the current because the inductor is being pulsed and the little uh, colour changing LEDs don't like being reset all the time. They don't like it when the power goes off, they lose their colour. Can I carefully shove this in here? Um, also, when you're running them, a very reduced current in parallel. The ones that go to red will just hog the current because the reds get a lower uh, forward voltage. So while they're going through the red sequence, that will be the dominant colour. It will quite often, if it's supposed to be purple or magenta or uh, yellow, it will just be red because the greens and blues won't light while the reds are lit because they're, the current is so limited. At this point in time, this circuit is now active. So I'm going to carefully crop that, and I'm going to plug my little tree in here, which uh, should actually have been rotated to the side, and I'm going to cover the solar panel, and the little tree has lit. Okay, that's a good start. Let's stuff this into here. We'll get the battery and we'll shove it down the inside here, and we'll get that and we'll just leave it loose at the moment. And by loose at the moment, I mean loose forever, probably. These things do let water in. All solar lights let water in. So it would maybe may be a good idea to uh, avoid, you know, actually protect things, lift them up off the base. Um, before I go too far, I'm going to separate these because they are bridging together a wee bit. Let's see if I can part this the Moses effect part. That's looking okay. And then I'm going to twist that carefully without shorting it out, which it wants to short out. And then I'm going to angle it over like that. This is just uh, just begging to short out, isn't it? Which, when I short this out, it is effectively running the battery current through the inductor because of the way these work. 
OK, that looks more or less it. I suppose it would have been nicer to angle it over and then up the way, but you know what? That looks all right. I think that looks all right. Shall we flash it up? Yeah, uh-huh. Right, let's put this dome over now. And we'll turn the light, we'll take the exposure off, and we'll turn the light out, and hopefully it's going to be dark enough that it is going to light. Yes, it has. The little tree has lit. Uh, I do now get the urge to actually fan more LEDs out in other directions, but that's looking pretty good. That is looking a lot nice than just that little cold white LED at the bottom. So that's certainly something to work on. Um, turn the light on, bring it back, watch your eyes. Just out of interest, how would this look like in the blue dome? I don't think it would be that bright because uh, that would engage in what's called subtractive colour filtering. As LEDs just put out a single wavelength anyway, unless you used white LEDs, that's going to tame that down. I should have actually been careful about not. Let's turn this off. It actually is still visible inside the blue dome, but the green one looks the nicest. And it needs centred up, it needs aligned, it needs tweaked, but you know what? Uh, light coming back, watch your eyes. That's good enough. That looks fine to me. And with the combination of the uh, the new battery and uh, this sort of larger display of LEDs, it's improved the light greatly. The battery's going to last a lot longer, particularly given that during peak summer, when you've got loads of current in there, it's going to, you know, that battery's going to handle it a lot better than the tiny little button cell. But there we go. I would say that was a success. I would say that worked pretty well. I'm going to I'm going to lock this exposure off because uh, I forget about that and then it's just bounced up and down. Another thing is that uh, if you decide, well, where's that lonely LED in its own? Because this is a socket, you can either plug this little adapter and you can plug whatever you want into it, really. Uh, but, or you could just put the LED in its own, one LED, and that LED will light up brighter on its own just as a point of green light. And it could be sort of shaped over towards the middle. So uh, that just makes it really versatile. So there we go. That was quite a fun project. I enjoyed that. And now I'm going to go and stick this out in the garden and see how it looks. So that is a good result.